Hi there, everyone, and welcome back to another week of the Bulletproof Hygiene Podcast. We're so thankful that you are joining us this week as we feel that, as usual, we're a little biased, but we feel that this week's um, episode is especially important and may hit home um, for a lot of us or be a familiar concept, as we know it's a very common and important issue in dentistry and dental hygiene and in the dental profession as a whole. Uh, Today, we'll be talking about mental health for dental professionals, Um, and we have said again and again that no one can give sustainably from a place of deficit, right? So we've all nodded our heads in agreement and said amen to that. Even more, we've experienced this principle in action in our own lives, possibly multiple times and for varying durations of time. Um, Why is it that When it comes to being a healthcare provider, taking care of our mental health hygiene often falls to the back of our minds, and that pun is intended. I don't have an answer to this question, um, except that I think a lot of people who get into healthcare and service professions kind of have this, I don't know, this want to give, right, and want to be of service to others, and sometimes there is a lack of, like, balance and awareness of what we need to refuel in order to continue giving, right, over a long period of time in a healthy way, and with boundaries, I'm sorry, and with care and consideration and respect to ourselves and our own lives. I think it can sometimes be um, difficult for us to do that if our our go-to or automatic is to be giving people. You know, it's not a bad thing. Obviously, it's a gift. Um, but there has to be balance. Yeah. And I, I agree with you. And I think it's hard because think about the reality of our day every day. It's patient after patient after patient coming in for us to help them. So it, it is easy to lose sight of, you know, we always say it's like when you get on an airplane and they say, if we lose altitude or, you know, lose oxygen and the oxygen mass drop down, you have to put it on yourself before you can help the person next to you. Mm -hmm. And we lose sight of that because there's patient after patient after patient looking to us to treat them and help them and guide them. And I think this mental health issue that we're going to talk about today has to be such an intentional thing for us. We have to step back and say, I can't, give out of deficit. I've got to make sure I'm taken care of so that that I can be the best version of myself. So I love that we're talking about this today. Absolutely. And one of the first things that I want to talk about is what uh, the definitions or kind of like what, how can we define being in a state of mental health? Because it's not like a simple one-liner. It's, it's pretty intricate. So I kind of want to review that first. And for that purpose, Um, I found a really great article from RDH magazine called how, I'm sorry, called um, Mental Health for the Dental Professional. And it was written by Bethany Montoya, which says close to half of all U.S. adults will experience mental illness to some degree during their lives. Like any other part of the body, the mind is not immune to illness, but there are many options for help. The World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. While this statement serves as a basic description of what it means to be mentally healthy in a general sense, we know that circumstances in life are subject to constantly change. Physical health, relationships, working conditions, and basic needs can shift over time, requiring a person to periodically adjust his or her way of coping to maintain mental well-being. For this reason, it has been suggested that a more comprehensive definition be used for mental health, a dynamic state of internal equilibrium which enables individuals to use their abilities in harmony with universal values of society, basic cognitive and social skills, Ability to recognize, express, and modulate one's own emotions, as well as empathize with others. Flexibility and ability to cope with adverse life events and function in social roles. And harmonious relationship between body and mind represent important components of mental health, which contribute to varying degrees to the state of internal equilibrium. Simply put, life has a way of presenting us with a variety of good and bad experiences at a steady pace, and our ability to keep a balanced outlook will determine our mental health. Now that we've got a basic understanding of what it means to have mental health, it's helpful to know some of the stressors that can negatively impact that internal equilibrium we just talked about. 
um, that we need to live happy and fulfilled lives. So in the healthcare industry, as we know, burnout syndrome is a common threat to providers' mental health, and it's usually associated with challenging, demanding work in combination with lack of time, appropriate resources, and support from leadership. When looking at the dental profession exclusively, it has been determined that things such as long working hours, not enough time with family, low office morale, salary, the pressure of a heavy workload, and problems at home can contribute to an individual's struggles with his or her mental health. It's fair to say that circumstances in our fields can absolutely have an impact on our mental health. It can be really difficult sometimes to identify mental health problems. We're trained to identify, obviously, oral pathology by clinical presentation, the presence or absence of pain, diagnostic testing, and the patient's own historic accounts. Unlike the mouth, however, the mind is non-physical and illness does not typically present itself as painful or visible. Further, there are very few opportunities or op options available for reliable diagnostic testing, and instead, detection of signs related to mental illness are most often seen externally by others as behavioral changes or experienced internally by the affected person in the way that he or she thinks and feels. So next I wanna look at some early signs of mental illness because like um, we just mentioned, you know, a lot of times these things are identified by others, the people who know us the best and have watched us kind of change or uh, have a shift in our behavior and expression of our feelings. So some early signs of mental illness can include feeling deeply sad, anxious, angry, or apathetic loss of energy, extreme worrying or fear, mental fog or confusion, so social withdrawal, sleeping too much or too little, increased or decreased appetite, feeling worthless or carrying unnecessary guilt and thinking about death. Over time, these symptoms may increase in severity and frequency depending on the individual. And in advanced cases, affected individuals may feel intensely depressed and overwhelmed, losing their ability to function in day-to-day -day life. They may behave out of character, resort to drug or alcohol use, and seriously consider suicide. These are intense feelings for anyone to bear, but for dental professionals specifically, dealing with ongoing unmanaged mental illness can have a negative impact on their ability to support the team and provide quality care to patients. The following statistics tell us why we shouldn't wait until we or our colleagues are suffering an acute mental health issue to get help. So it's not surprising that dentists and doctors uh, rank high among the occupations where the em employees have high levels of depression because of all the giving, all of the output that's involved in doing what we do every day. So in one particular study done by the Journal of American Dental Association, of the American Dental Association, on 3,500 dentists, the results showed that 38% of these dentists felt anxious and worried, 34% of the dentists stated uh, that they were physically or emotionally exhausted, and 26% had frequent headaches and backaches, clearly demonstrating the high level of depression among dentists. Let's look at one other study by the NIH, which kind of looked at burnout, depression, and suicidal ideation in dental and dental hygiene students, because my argument would be that this isn't just dentists, right? So if dentists are impacted this way, I think it naturally follows that those who face similar issues in a similar setting, similar stressors, similar output um, needs, kind of probably face similar things. So this is by the National Institutes of Health and it was called Burnout, Depression and Suicidal Ideation in Dental and Dental Hygiene Students. Um, this study found that 6% of dental and 9% of dental hygiene students were above the cutoff for clinically significant suicidal ideation, but there were no statistical significance statistical differences between dental and hygiene students. There were no differences noted in the dental students based on gender for any of the measures. Depression was significantly associated with their three subscales of burnout. So significant correlation between burnout and depression. And I just wanted to say that it's really interesting to me that it, it was actually 6% of the, of the dental and 9% of the dental hygiene students. Right. So I, it, what you said is so true. And I know all of our listeners, you know, if they've been practicing for probably more than a year or two mm -hmm. can relate to the burnout aspect. And I, you know, in school there, you know, I know these were dental students. So this was the process of, we all remember the days of school where it was so draining and so exhausting because you were practicing clinically but then you were studying outside of that and preparing for exams. And, you know, there was, there was no time 
Um, but we all know the shift now as we practice is we're not studying necessarily for, a, you know, an exam, um, but we are constantly moving and working and our schedules, you know, hopefully those are full and, and we're busy, but at the same time, it can be overwhelming. So just credence to what you were saying about this isn't just a dentist issue. This is definitely a hygienist and uh, I would argue assistants and office manager issue as well. I think it's a team team problem. hundred percent. Yeah. So I think just like we look at when we are measuring and assessing for um, dental hygiene issues and, you know, perio issues, uh, oral cancer issues, we've kind of got to look back at where this is all originating or what's causing all of this so that we can see what the possible solutions are. So um, in another article, it was called Depression Among Dentists and Nine Reasons Why, they cited confinement to small workspace area as one of the reasons why this is happening. Uh, Dentistry practice in in isolation, kind of like hygiene, we're in our own lane, we're, you know, one provider treating one patient at a time kind of can feel like we're on a little bit of an island if we don't intentionally reach out to other hygienists, right? Even in my office of nine hygienists, sometimes it can feel like that. Like I'm just in my own lane. I can come in the office and kind of like do my own thing, kind of go about my day, um, you know, interacting with whoever I need functionally, but not really in a team mental orientation. Like I'm not necessarily partnering with my hygiene counterparts on a daily basis to say, Hey, can you help me with this? Can we talk about something that was difficult? Can we kind of partner on some, you know, that has to be kind of intentional. So practicing in isolation, I could imagine that dentists feel that way too. Um, Another reason is the stress of perfection. We're all working on little teeny tiny details, right? So the, I, I can only imagine like what it must feel like to be doing like a full mouth rehabilitation, you know, like changing someone's mouth for the rest of their life, essentially. And like, what, what if they're not happy with it? What if the bite's wrong? What if, you know, so many things that can go wrong that if it's not, you know, quote unquote, perfect or as close to perfect as possible, I can't imagine what that, the weight of that stress feels like. Yeah. And I want to, I want to hop in on that only because you think about this aspect too. We are working in the most, in a very small environment on very minute issues. You know, we're looking at, like you just said, there's, we have to look at the entire microcosm of the mouth and the body, but at the same time, focus in on very small aspects, you know, as in hygiene, we're focused on that six millimeter pocket and making sure we get that cavitron on every single surface. And, you know, we're doing so much little details that we're so focused on, but also trying to keep the big picture in mind. It is mentally exhausting and taxing um, to do all of that from a point of perfectionism. It's really stressful. Yep. Some of the other, um, reasons why and contributing factors are the economical and financial pressure on new dentists. And I would argue, and probably the dentist would argue on veteran dentists as well. <laughs> I don't yes. think it's a way. Okay. Um, long working hours and time pressure. So time uh, parameters, basically the pressure of working with patients, anxiety felt while treating a patient, the personality type of the dentist or hygienist and lack of physical activity if we're sitting all day. So, um, I want to kind of go through before we start talking about solutions, and I promise that we're going to get there. Um, I just want to talk about one more thing or a couple more things, actually. And one of the things is um, that women and minority groups, this is a different article that I really, really appreciated. It's called How Dentistry Professionals Can Manage Their Mental Health. And in this article, uh, Bo Peters noted um, that women and minority groups can face even greater challenges and bigger stressors. It's not uncommon for women to experience microaggressions in the workplace and female dentists who are in the minority within the industry are no exception to this rule. Microaggressions might include things like indirect put downs, belittling, exclusion, dismissive comments or actions. Um, And they, and he said, you know, if you're experiencing any of these issues in your workplace, talking to your HR team is the best solution if you have an HR team. In the meantime, hearing and experiencing those things every day can contribute to a lot of extra stress. You might even start to question your skills, which can affect your self-esteem and trigger feelings of anxiety. Once you have a better understanding of what might be causing you to feel stressed, depressed, or anxious, you can work on managing your mental health more effectively, but how do you do that? So manage in regards to managing our stress, let's say a typical day at work includes various time pressures, economic pressure, isolation, and confinement. That doesn't exactly sound like a pleasant day at the office for most of us, right? But if we think about it, for dental professionals, that's often the norm, even when we don't realize it. So those in the industry have to deal with a lot of pressure every day, and they have to do a lot of it on their own. 
you might even have to deal with um, that kind of expressed anxiety from the patients, right? So a patient who's extremely fearful or anxious, suggesting things like rescheduling or offering uh, general health and wellness tips can help. But your own anxieties might be triggered in the process, right? So managing your stress and my stress every day is crucial to getting through some of the things listed above. And thankfully, there are several things that we can do to reduce our stress levels every day. And these are simple, small things that include sharing your frustrations with others, spending more time communicating with one another, working sensible hours, taking breaks throughout the day, and showing compassion to yourself. So things like mindfulness and meditation can also help throughout the day. Practicing mindfulness allows us to focus on breathing and the present moment, which is all that we have control or power in. Doing so can cause us to, to let go of feelings of thinking about past regrets and worries about the future. Even a few minutes can lower your stress significantly so that you can continue with your day. Lowering stress is all about finding something that works for you. So don't be afraid to try a few different things and make self-care priorities so that you are not burning out or suffering unnecessarily. And for me, this, this looks like um, this looks like more recently praying. Uh, walking alone, doing yoga. I just kind of reconnected with yoga after several years hiatus, making phone calls when I want to get grounded or when I'm having a problem staying in the present and kind of need to like talk through something, Um, even just taking deep breaths. And then I think I've mentioned this before, but I learned a really um, helpful presence tool from Jay Shetty, which is the 54321 tool. Um, and that's like, okay, if I want to get grounded in the moment, I can think of, I can, I can sit or stand and identify five things I can see. Then I identify four things I can touch, three things I can hear, two things I can smell, and one thing that I can taste. And that just engages all the senses in what's happening right now and being rooted in the present moment. And that kind of helps us to to it, it lowers anxiety and depression, right? Because anxiety is future casting and depression is thinking of the past for most people, you know, and it can be compulsive. It can be um, a lot of times it's, uh, it's not conscious, right? It's not like I'm trying to, anyone's trying to think of those things, but a lot of times that's where some of that stuff is coming from. So that really helps me to just get rooted in the present, which eliminates a lot of those feelings. Yeah, I love that practice. And I think part of the reason that that is successful is because it it shifts your focus and your mindset, because a lot of times anxiety and depression is us getting kind of fixated and focused on these, you know, same concept over and over and we feel trapped by it. Um, so stepping outside of that and really, like you said, being present and looking at what's around you and feeling that and experiencing that a lot of times will shift that, that thought into the the current and make you realize, Hey, things might not be as bad as I thought they were, you know, just shifting that can make a big difference. And I, I think for me, one of my things is just, I, I practice gratitude a lot. Um, and I've learned as I go through the years that it's the small things. Like I feel like looking in the past, I would get so fixated on future things. Like I can't wait for this and I can't wait for this. And it was always kind of this waiting game. And here lately I've really enjoyed just looking at the very small moments, like sipping coffee on my back porch for five minutes in the morning is huge. Um, you know, having one of my boys come up and just like sit next to me on the couch and want to show me something. These are these like small moments of joy that I've really started just getting really enveloped by. And it, it, it does really kind of relieve stress and strain. And then just jokingly, I have this mantra that plays in my head. Um, when the moments at work are stressful and patients are hard and, you know, I'm running behind and, and all the things that happen is I do think very often I'm not sleeping here tonight. Like just, it's that like freedom moment. Like you're going to get past this. We're not spending the night here. We're not going to be dealing with this patient for the next six hours. Like it's going to happen. We're going to make it. It's going to be okay. So I have that own little like lifeboat thought in my head every day, which helps me a lot. Yeah, I, I want to like, this can be a really hard topic for a lot of people um, to talk about and hear about, I think, because many of us have experienced like the loss of loved ones via because of mental health issues in our lives. Um, so I know that it's a sad and hard topic, but the reason that 
Teresa and I felt like this was so imperative to talk about is because we've experienced firsthand, like at the last few summits we've done, like I think at every one, you know, Dr. Craig or Dr. Bolden or someone has received a text like, you know, insinuating or just straight out saying, hey, I was going to end my life. Thank you so much for having this thing because now I feel hopeful, you know, and it's like a dentist who's attending. It's like one, one of the people in the audience just sitting at one of our tables, you know, so like I think it's possible that a lot of our colleagues are feeling this way and we kind of have a responsibility to ourselves and to each other to be able to kind of identify when this might be taking place so that we can offer support. Um, so what actions can we take if we suspect mental illness in one of our colleagues or dental professionals? So the best starting point is to approach the person with your observations, um, create a safe place for him or her to share what they're experiencing with complete privacy, make sure to actively listen without judgment or interruption, provide encouragement and help direct the person toward the help he or she needs. If you're experiencing mental health issues personally, finding a trustworthy person to talk to is of utmost importance. Once this confidential connection has been established and concerns have been communicated, the next step is to seek specialized support. So just like our patients can't properly treat their own tooth abscesses, we've got to remember that mental illness requires help from a trained professional. So some examples, as we know, of trained professionals in this arena are therapists, counselors, psychologists, primary care physicians, psychiatrists, and pastoral counselors, they are all equipped to assist in managing mental illness. Depending on the type of professional, treatment options might include making lifestyle changes to reduce stress and emotional triggers, counseling to work through past experiences or traumas, and or medication to achieve a healthier chemical balance in the brain. Finding the ideal patient-provider partnership may require continued research or more than one professional consultation, but it's important to remain steadfast and hopeful. Once interve interventions are made, the road to mental wellness can begin and a positive outlook can be restored. One experiences great relief when the heavy weight of mental affliction is lifted. No matter the role you have in a dental community, your educational background or stage in life, one thing we all have in common is a fundamental need for mental wellness. We are gifted with intelligent, imaginative, individually unique minds that allow us to connect with one another and impact our world in profound ways. As complex and wonderful as they are, our minds require constant care and cannot be neglected when the, when the threat to optimal health exists. Mental illness is as real as it is common, but thankfully there are many options available to receive help. A human with a healthy mind and a passion for dentistry is a beautiful thing. Absolutely. And I want to touch on a few thoughts about how to help ourselves maintain good brain and mental health. Um, and one of the articles you read earlier, it talked about, you know, it's harder to identify mental health issues because we're so used to like in the dental world, looking at physical manifestations of problems. And so mentally we don't often don't often see that. But there was a sentence in, in one of those articles, and I know this article had been, been written a while ago, that talked about it, you know, mental health not necessarily being a physical, you know, it's a non-physical kind of thing. And I want to argue with that just a little bit, because the recent studies that are showing us that there are so many physical things that do impact our brain health and wellness. So I totally agree. We've, you know, we have touted getting, you know, support through therapy and, and counseling and that sort of thing since day one. And I totally agree with that, but I think there's are some ways that simple ways that we can help ourselves as well, um, as we're going through those processes. So, um, I just wanted to touch on some simple practices to meet our physical needs that increase our capacity to use our foundational capabilities and therefore use our high, higher level competencies. Because the reality is we need those on a daily basis for what we're doing. You know, the kind of work we're doing really does require that higher level thinking. And if we're really struggling and not doing that, that's going to really impact what we're doing and then take us even deeper down that rabbit hole. So um, sleep, I know we've talked about this many times before, but sleep is actually the number one factor to influence optimal brain performance and health. Sleep helps to improve all of our brain's capabilities. It, you know, cleans it up at night. Um, it helps us have the ability to execute on a higher level competencies. And when we need to be at our best, we've got to make sleep priority number one. And by prioritizing seven 
to eight hours of good quality sleep, obviously aided by good sleep hygiene, um, we will provide ourselves with the best possible start. So, you know, if, if you're feeling a struggle, that, that is something that can really give you a boost if you're able to manage that. And again, you may need to see your doctor to help you manage that. Um, but you know, so sleep is a super important and great, obviously for getting us prepared for the next day. But I also want to talk about taking daytime mental recovery breaks because that's also super important. So as we know, the brain is an immensely complex organ, but it is certainly not a machine that can work optimally at higher speeds for long periods of time. For example, the portion of our brain that handles most of our executive functions at work, things like problem solving, making decisions, controlling our impulses, is a very in energy hungry system and it tires easily. Therefore, it is also a physical need to recharge our energy throughout the day. So getting a brain break throughout our workday can give us more energy and lower our stress for the rest of the day. So at a minimum, you can impact how you feel and perform with as little as two, three to 20 minute recharge sessions during your workday. And these sessions could be scheduled before important meetings in which you need to be present or at the start of focus time sessions in which you need to concentrate. Your recharge sessions could be passive, spent reading a fiction book, doing a breathing exercise, meditating or chatting to a close colleague or friend. Or you could take an active break by taking a 10 plus minute walk in nature, perform 20 squats or lunges or perform 20 burpees. So just being really intentional with taking those little breaks is important. Um, and I wanted to talk about breathing. I am currently reading um, the book Breath and um, am really captivated by it. And um, just how we breathe really impacts how our brain is functioning and working. So just doing some simple, short breathing exercises, um, that you can do anywhere at any point in time. And I'll even say while you're cleaning teeth, this can happen. Um, but one of those examples is what they call box breathing, and it really brings calm and focus. So this is best for when you need a little brain boost and more focus is just sitting up, you know, straight and taking in um, breath. So you breathe in for a count of four to five seconds, and then you hold it for four to five seconds. You exhale for four to five seconds, and then, um, inhale again, so, or then, sorry, hold your breath for four to five seconds and then inhale again. So it's this box breathing that you can kind of mentally think through, and that will bring some calm and focus pretty quickly. Um, there's another breathing practice to bring more deep relaxation. And this is best when you're feeling stressed or anxious or need to relax before you sleep. So this is, you can sit or lie down. Um, and it's, um, you want to do this for at least two to five minutes. And basically you breathe in for your, through your nose for a count of four to seven, and then you pause for a count of two. Then you breathe out for, through the nose for a slow count of six to 10 and you pause for two. So you can increase or decrease the duration of the breath, but the most important factor is that you exhale longer than you inhale. And that's again, more for the deep relaxation. So those are simple things you can do throughout your day. Um, even walking down the hall, you can kind of mentally do that. So that's a good idea. Another big factor when it comes to brain health is movement. So a lack of movement equals a lack of cognitive skills. Not only does our brain have a physical need for energy, but also regular movement. So John Rady is the author of Go Wild, and he co-authored that with Richard Manning. And this book demonstrates some hard-hitting evidence for the importance of movement. For example, John mentions that he and his colleagues found that exercise not only helped treat cognitive impairments, it helped prevent them. And even though these studies were focused more on dementia and Alzheimer's, improvements were found on a wide range of impairments from memory loss to mental acuity. The researchers considered that cognitive impairment was a cause of being too sedentary. Why is this? Because when you move, you increase the circulation of blood to the brain, which delivers more oxygen, nutrients, and neurotransmitters. But interestingly, this is not the biggest benefit. Another more major benefit is improved neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. So neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to change or rewire itself. It helps us learn, develop, and recover from injuries, and it is critical for behavior change. 
Neurogenesis is the birth of new brain cells or neurons. And essentially this is brain growth. So related to growth exercise, or sorry, related to growth, exercise has also been found to prevent a loss of gray matter. So interestingly, exercise has been found to increase the size of the brain's hippocampus or the, our memory, where we process our memory, which means that exercise increases memory. Exercise has also been found to improve the connections and functioning of the whole brain. A lack of exercise has been found to decrease the brain's functioning and therefore the user's capability and higher level competencies are inhibited. Therefore, not only does our brain have a physical need for energy, but also regular movement. And John discovered that this holds true for young as well as old brains. So much of the benefit from exercise is thought to be linked to the fact that exercise places demands on the brain, which cause it to release brain derived neurotrophic factor and insulin like growth factor. And uh, the BDNF helps brains to survive and encourage the growth of new cells. And it is vital to brain functions such as learning, memory, and higher thinking. And then IGF supports growth. So by getting as little as 20 to 30 minutes of moderate walking split up throughout the day, you can provide the brain with a better supply of oxygen, nutrients, and neurotransmitters in addition to helping the brain to change and grow. And I think this is a big deal for us in dentistry because like Brittany said, one of the causes of depression and mental health issues is lack of movement. We're stuck in these small rooms all day, leaning over patients. You know, we are not making big stat, you know, we're big wide movements. We are kind of staying small to ourselves. So planning and being intentional about moving our bodies either throughout the day or at the end of the work day or before you go in in the morning can be huge on this front. Um, lastly is food. Um, like an expensive car, our brain functions best when it gets only premium fuel and eating high quality foods that contain lots of vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants nourishes the brain and protects it from oxidative stress, which is the waste or the free radicals produced when the body uses oxygen and that those uh, free radicals obviously damage our cells. So unfortunately, just like an expensive car, your brain can be damaged if you ingest anything other than premium fuel. If substances from low premium fuels, such as what you get from processed or refined foods get to the brain, it has little ability to get rid of them. Diets high in refined sugars, for example, are harmful to the brain. In addition to worsening your body's regulation of insulin, they also promote inflammation and oxidative stress. Multiple studies have found a correlation between a diet high in refined sugars and impaired brain function and even a worsening of symptoms of mood disorders such as depression. So I wanna talk about the reason why food affects the way we feel. And a big part is serotonin. So serotonin is a neurotransmitter that helps regulate sleep and appetite, mediate moods and inhibit pain. Since about 95% of our serotonin is produced in our GI tract, and our GI tract is lined with a hundred million nerve cells or neurons, it makes sense that the inner workings of our GI tract, our digestive system, don't just help you digest food, but also guide our emotions. What's more, the function of these neurons and the production of neurotransmitters like serotonin is highly influenced by the billions of good bacteria that make up our intestinal microbiome. These bacteria play an essential role in our health. They protect the lining of our intestines and ensure they provide a strong barrier against toxins and bad bacteria. They limit inflammation. They improve how well we absorb nutrients from our food and they activate neural pathways that travel directly between the gut and the brain. And studies have found that traditional diets like Mediterranean and the traditional Japanese diet based or compared to a typical Western diet have shown that the risk of depression is 25 to 35% lower in those who eat a traditional diet. Scientists accounts for this difference because these traditional diets tend to be high in vegetables, fruits, unprocessed grains, and fish and seafood, and to contain only modest amounts of lean meat and dairy. They're also void of processed and refined foods and sugars, which are staples of the Western dietary pattern. 
In addition, many of these unprocessed foods are fermented and therefore act as natural probiotics. This may all sound a little implausible to you, but the notion that good bacteria not only influence what your gut digests and absorbs, but they also affect the degree of inflammation throughout your body, as well as your mood and energy level is really gaining traction among researchers. So based on this information, obviously we're going to suggest that you just start paying attention to how eating different foods makes you feel and not just in the moment or later, you know, a few hours after, but the next day. Um, we challenge you to try eating a clean diet for two to three weeks. And that means cutting out all processed foods and sugars and see how you feel. And then you can slowly reintroduce foods back into your diet one by one. And again, see how that affects you and how you feel mental fog, clarity, you know, stomach upset. Um, I know when some people go clean, they can't believe how much better they feel both physically and emotionally and how much worse they then feel when they reintroduce the foods that are known to enhance inflammation. By eating foods that contain nutrients such as folate, B12, omega-3, um, then you are able to help you, your brain to increase its execution of its capabilities in addition to helping the brain to change and grow. So I think just being mindful, how are you sleeping? You know, are you reducing stress? Are you moving your body? And what are you putting in to fuel it? All are super, super important. Um, and something to consider. And I only, I want to add one last thing in that Brittany touched on, and I think is super important, um, for life is connection. And, you know, Brittany was talking about what we do at summit, um, when we all come together and see each other eye to eye and face to face and get to share, you know, Hey, I'm struggling with this. And how are you managing that? And what are you doing here? And what's working for you? Those connection times are super, super important. So I'd encourage you, if you don't feel like you have some strong connection within your practice or community to seek that out. And whether that's us here at Bulletproof, obviously we'd love to connect with you. Um, maybe it's joining a mastermind group. Maybe it's creating a group within your own practice or community. That's super important for feeling that fulfillment and being heard and being seen. Um, so I want to encourage you on that front as well. That being said, if you have not yet joined our Mighty Network, I'm going to encourage you to do that. It's a free app that you can download. Just Google uh, or just search in your app store, Mighty Networks, and then search Bulletproof Hygiene and come join us. It's free to join. Like I said, it's a great place to connect, ask questions, share challenges, help find solutions, and just connect with one another. So if you haven't done that yet, we would love to meet you there. Thanks so much for joining us this week, everyone. We hope that this was helpful and insightful. Have a great week. See you next time.